I was in a really a, a lovely shop uh, that had, among one of the very few unlovely things, a this for people just listening, some pins which have on the left vaxxed, I'm vaccinated, uh, and on the right pronoun pins. And to me, this reminded me of the cultural moment we are living in, which has people who are confused about what sex is and who are insisting that however you feel like identifying is the sex that you are, and therefore it's paramount and maybe the most important thing about you to announce your pronouns in your bios and in introducing yourself to other people and in enforcing that on uh, all, of the, all the people in your world. Well, it's many of the same people who are certain uh, that although 500 million years of evolution might be wrong, the authorities that just came to you dressed in lab coats couldn't possibly be, and therefore uh, the new experimental technologies that everyone is being told they absolutely must take is the only way forward. Uh, did you want to add something? Yeah. Um, I wanted to introduce... I wondered... Um, and this is completely consistent with where you're headed here. When you see a consensus mm. and you also see coercion, you see people who depart from the consensus being punished, uh, and you therefore know that some percentage of the consensus is the result of people who fear saying otherwise, and that what uh, might be objections or diversity of opinion shows up as silence. The question is, why does the mind not register that that consensus isn't one? Or I think even more likely at the point you see intense coercion in the direction of a consensus, one ought to think that consensus is probably wrong. Yes. It wouldn't be necessary. If the yes. consensus were right, it would be naturally contagious. And this is a point that Neil Oliver was making in your conversation with him that you, that you had as well. Yes. So, yes. but does this fallacy have a name where you fail to register? You've seen the mechanism that created a consensus and yet your mind still thinks there's wide agreement when in fact it knows enough to know that it knows it at best, it knows nothing about how much organic agreement there actually is. Mm, yeah. I don't, I don't know if it has a name and if it does have a name, what the name is. Uh, I'm not too up on uh, all, all of the fallacies and, and their various names, but it does seem like it warrants one uh, because it is, it is, it is a psychological error, or maybe not, it's not a psychological error. It's a, it's a failure to recognize uh, a pattern that, that should be recognizable. Yeah, it, it is. And, you know, there's one other place I see a similar thing, which is if you had, you know, two shampoos and one of them has a slick advertising campaign uh, with a famous spokesperson or something like that, uh, you should probably think negatively about that one. Um, so anyway, I, I guess the point is why do, you know, this basket of pins here are <laughs> people purchasing things, broadcasting something downstream of a phony consensus, which is a funny thing to do. Of course, we don't know how well the pins sell, but the fact that they're sitting there means that somebody expected they would. Yeah. And I, and I saw this just moments really after I had, the reason I was in North Portland was to pick up... Um, a beautiful piece of art that I had commissioned many months ago, and um, just a small, a, a, a small piece of, of glass. And uh, I had a conversation with the artist who's lived in Portland uh, for, I, I think, maybe all of her life, but at least, um, at least since college. And she's, uh, you know, she's in our age range, uh, and I guess at some level, you've been doing this your entire life, but at this point, I just start talking to people as if they're going to be reasonable <laughs> rather than uh, being careful about not saying things about which the forced consensus would uh, seem to make us believe that uh, everyone probably disagrees with me and therefore you better not go there. And this lovely artist, this lovely woman just opened right up and she said, oh, yes, I, you know, I, I love Portland and I want to stay, but I can't, I don't know if we can. It's, it's such, it's such a mess here. And I, you know, I, and, and you know, to use uh, the language that I, we've been using for a long time, but I feel uh, Michael Schellenberger really formalized in his, in his book, San Francisco and presumably elsewhere. Francisco. 
San Francisco, yes, the book San Francisco, I can never say it, um, is we have had our compassion weaponized against us, right? We are told, oh, if you, if, if you don't basically allow those people to have terrible, terrible lives on the street in front of you, then you are being uncompassionate to them. And no, that's actually not compassionate any more than it is uh, compassionate to let a child cut themselves or starve themselves or believe that they are a different sex than they are and therefore need to start to medically transition. Uh, none, none of these things are the compassionate, the compassionate thing to do. So let's, let's so go. So hold on. Back to your point, though. Your yeah. point was that um, you open up to people and you <laughs> yes. tell them that you're actually not part of the consensus. And at least in and my experience, <laughs> it's actually rare that anybody actually pushes back on behalf of the consensus. It's like there's this thin veneer of like, we all agree on that. And then you say, well, actually, I don't. And people are like, yeah, me neither. Yeah. You know? So, mm -hmm. you know, no doubt there are people with whom that wouldn't work. Yep. But I think the question is, how tiny a minority is that? Yes. How tiny a minority is it who appears to be driving uh, culture and policy at a increasingly global level for all the rest of us on behalf of not even them. But even if they think it's for them, and even if it is for some tiny portion of them, sorry, no. Tyranny of a tiny minority, not okay. And in part, it's being allowed to happen because we are being told that it's a majority.